Hey, welcome to Engineering Tomorrow. As usual, I'm your host, Brian Gomsky. It is, as of right now, two days before Thanksgiving 2022. It is November 2nd. Um, we are all looking forward to a little bit of a long break. The last episode we recorded was actually September 26th, um, which was about indoor agriculture. For those of you who are a little bit sporadic with the episodes, uh, time does not exist, and this will just be the next episode. Um, but this has been a uh, episode in the making, um, and we're really excited to have a couple industry veterans on today. Um, George with Alliance and Troy with Midwest Machinery. Um, we are going to be going over the top mistakes people make when selecting and laying out custom air handlers, as well as the most important things to think about when selecting custom units. So do me a favor and sit back, relax, grab yourself a coffee or a beer, and get ready to start engineering for tomorrow. Broadcasting around the world. Around the world. This is Engineering Tomorrow, the podcast committed to bringing you the best in commercial construction, design, and engineering from the brightest minds in the industry. This is the stuff they don't teach you in school. So sit back, relax, and open your mind. You're about to get the insider knowledge to improve your next construction project or advance your career. This is Engineering Tomorrow. Wow, thank you for that intro. Uh, so when he says 30-year veterans, that means we're just old, George. So. Uh, speak for yourself. Right. Okay, fine. I will speak for myself. Yep. I just turned a big uh, mile marker and uh, I am a 40, old. right? Yeah, 40. 40. Yep. Yeah. Plus, no. 40 plus 10. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, why don't you guys introduce yourselves and um, tell us kind of a little bit about your background. Troy, you're a regular guest, so some of our people already know who you are, but maybe the, the Cliff Note version. I'll do Cliff Note version and then tell a little story about why George is here. So I am uh, president of Midwest Machinery Company. We have offices and uh, headquartered in St. Louis. Uh, next year will be our 100 year anniversary, which is pretty cool. We're planning the party now. Um, then we have offices in Kansas City, Tulsa and Oklahoma City. And then we're in a joint venture with another company, uh, engineered products based in Denver, Colorado. But, you know, historically our company has been associated with the wet side of the business and people working with us for, you know, 30 years probably think of us that way. But, you know, in the last 15 years, we've become much more of a systems related company and been seeking out a partnership with a custom air handler manufacturer for a while. And, you know, what we, as a cooling tower company, you know, as a company that works with cooling towers quite a bit, we're, we have the benefit of working on big projects. So big chilled water projects, you know, at, at hospitals or universities um, where they have big chillers, they have cooling towers, and they have generally custom air handlers. So it's always been a good fit for us. We just haven't found the right partner. And in our search, we uh, searched high and low and long and wide and talked to a lot of manufacturers and we kept getting referred back to Alliance Air Products. And so I think maybe it was a year ago, George, that we started talking and mm -hmm. uh, met a few times and uh, convinced them that uh, maybe they should give us a try. And uh, so our relationship with Alliance has uh, started about six months ago. It's a pretty um, I don't know why we're keeping it a secret. We're, we're not trying to keep it a secret, but we're, we still find people that haven't heard about it. So our hope is that with this podcast, everybody gets to know a little bit more about Alliance Air Products, a little bit about George, why it's a good fit for Midwest Machinery Company, and hopefully why it's a good fit for them. So George, all of that to say, um, we're very pleased to be representing Alliance Air Products. In the short time that we've had, we've uh, we've been able to win a successful project or two, got a lot of irons in the fire, and we, we like the momentum that we're building with you guys. So if you can, take a couple minutes, talk about maybe a little bit about your background and industry in this field. Why should anybody trust what you have to say? And then maybe a little bit about Alliance Air Products. Thanks. 
Thanks, Troy. Well, first of all, uh, we are very happy to have you guys as our representative uh, in your territories. Uh, you guys have been doing an awesome job. Uh, you're go-getters, and we truly do appreciate that. Um, as far as talking about me, I don't think I can what up myself to you for, I mean, that's a great yeah. introduction. <laughs> so <laughs> I might just have to say, yeah, I've been in the business 30 years. Um, it, it has actually been just about at 30 years. Um, you know, I, I got into this business originally uh, when I first came out of school doing pumps and mechanical sealing devices. And uh, I, I did a little stint in the electrical industry. Uh, I was a lighting specialist for a, um, a large electrical distributor in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. Uh, but then I um, Got back into the mechanical industry after I uh, took a job transfer out to Colorado when a, a friend of mine uh, asked me if I wanted to get into a joint uh, venture with a uh, startup company. And I was like, sure, why not? Give it a try. Uh, and, you know, it just it's, it's been a dream ever since. Um, it's uh, working for Alliance Air Products as their director of sales is um, it's the best job that anybody can really have. And I, I say that and I have goosebumps thinking about it because <laughs> I mean, I really love what I do. Um, I love coming to work every day. I mean, I don't mind getting up at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Why not? Uh, but it, it, you know, this is, this is a fantastic company to work for. Um, you know, we build custom air handling equipment and that is something that I, I dream about. Uh, I, really am intrigued by uh, everything that goes into the behind the scenes uh, preparation of putting together a piece of equipment and then seeing the final product when it's on the job site. That's that's a big thrill for me. Yeah. So, you know, in all of our conversations, Brian, you probably remember a lot of these, these uh, meetings that we had. We met, I think, with three or four different manufacturers. Um, what we quickly noticed with with Alliance, and we started with one of Alliance's owners um, uh, who lives in San Diego, and then he introduced me to you and Luis Placencia, who's the president of the company. Mm -hmm. And every encounter that we had, you know, obviously starting with senior leaders like yourselves, um, but then even as we toured the plant and the factory and the facility. Um, Everywhere we ran into, we were met with enthusiasm, which is one of my most, I, I just love, if I'm interviewing somebody or talking with a customer or anybody and they have enthusiasm, they've got me. Um, and that's what I think we all walked away from immediately with Alliance was just the level of enthusiasm that everybody had. And this was in the middle of the pandemic when certainly there was plenty of reasons for people to be mully grubby and not enthusiastic about things. So honestly, that's what sold us with you guys, and we've been happy ever since. So maybe tell us a little bit about Alliance. And what I, when I go around and introduce Alliance to our customers, we'll generally say it's the biggest custom air handler manufacturer that you've never heard of or maybe never dealt with. And I think a lot of that is because custom air handlers tend to be regional. A lot of times you'll have, um, companies in the Northeast or upper Midwest or Canada, or, you know, in your case, you're associated with a West coast manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So sometimes here in St. Louis, for example, they may not have heard of Alliance and be unaware that you're one of the probably top three or four, five manufacturers in mm -hmm. North America. So go ahead. Tell us a little bit about that origin story. Yeah, that, that, that has a lot of truth to it. Uh, well, the company was started in 2004. Um, it was started by a gentleman by the name of Tom Sieber. Uh, Tom had worked for another air handling company and, and had left it and then um, got involved with a couple guys here in the uh, south um, part of California. Uh, and with, uh, I'll call it a somewhat small investment, uh, started the company. Uh, we started in a 30,000 square foot uh, warehouse, and it was pretty much just an empty warehouse, and we were able to build things inside of it. And the business that we went after whenever we first started was retrofit business because we only had 15 employees at the time. We had one shear machine. We had one brake machine. We had one forklift, 15 employees. And 
I mean, you can't build a whole lot of equipment with just mm-hmm. 15 guys, right? So, uh, you know, our, our guys uh, would physically go out to a job site and measure a air handler that was going to be retrofitted. Uh, you know, do a site survey, figure out where the duct locations had to be, the electrical, uh, everything that comes along with that particular air handler that's going to be retrofitted. And then they would come back and draw everything up by hand on paper, put a submittal together with a typewriter, and then take it out and, well, not a typewriter, but a computer, and then take it out, get it approved, and then come back and build it and then be there whenever the piece of equipment went into service. Um, so that's how we cut our teeth into the business. And now we've grown, uh, we're in our third building. We've got 240,000 square feet of manufacturing facility. Um, you know, it's uh, or the manufacturing facility is located in Tijuana, Mexico. Our headquarters are in San Diego. Um, that's where our, our main offices are at. Uh, but our, our facility is over here in Tijuana, Mexico. And that's where we do, uh, that's where the magic happens, to be quite honest. Yeah, I want to follow up with that um, because we we did go down there and visit the manufacturing facilities and we're blown away. But go back to the origin story. When the founders decided to start this business, you said 04, is that what you said? 2004, right. Okay, in 04, what were the circumstances in the industry that caused them to say, we need to go do this? Was it just, uh, you know, plenty of demand and not enough capacity? Did somebody think they had a better mousetrap? What what caused them to start this business? Uh, I've heard a couple different versions of it. Okay. Uh, one, Give us one the year... most uh, comedic one then, please. All right. The most comedic one was, hey, if, if we don't start a company, we're going to be out of work. So they started the company. Uh, no, it's, you know, uh, you brought something up a little bit earlier is that um, you you tend to see a lot of custom air handling manufacturers as being regionalized, right? So you've got guys on the West Coast, you've got guys sort of central, you've got guys on the East Coast, Northeast, Southeast, um, but you don't see a whole lot of shipping cross country from both sides. Um, we're a little bit different with that. And, and one of the reasons that I say that is because where we're actually located, we've got the capability of, um, great distribution through this corridor here. And that's pretty much because Tijuana is a huge area in Mexico for production for, uh, what we call maquiladoras, uh, which are foreign companies that have a assembly or some type of production facility here in Mexico. Um, you know, through the Tijuana border, you've got like a billion dollars of business that goes across that border every day, both ways. So, uh, it's super busy here all the time. Plus we have super great, uh, quality as far as people are concerned. Um, you know, our employees, uh, a lot of them are sheet metal workers. So, you know, when they come to us, they've already got some experience in what they're going to be doing. And that makes for a really super good product. And that's pretty much the whole reason to why the company got started and being here in Tijuana is because we wanted to build a quality piece of equipment and be able to um, supply the market in the United States. The original thought was, yeah, let's just start regionally which was Southern California, uh, Nevada, Arizona. That's pretty much the three states that we cut our teeth on. But then we started to see that we got more and more requests to, hey, I want to represent your company. Um, When I came along with the company, you know, we had at that time a handful of of representatives selling our product. And now we go the whole ways to the Northeast. So, you know, we've got representation in New Jersey and New York City and, you know, the Virginia area and then come down through the central part of the United States, the whole ways on the West Coast uh, up through Seattle. Um, and, and we've grown the business with the intent of growing it, but not to be just grow it so fast that you can't keep up with it. So we were, and, and, and Troy, Brian, you'll probably agree with his statement. It took us a while to make a decision on whether or not we were going to bring you guys aboard. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we had the right fit because we don't just look at as our representatives as just our customers. We look at you guys as family. We really do. 
No, we appreciate that. And it was definitely noticed uh, the amount of time it took for you guys to get to a yes. Um, so we'll remember that for quite a while. But uh, no, seriously, it we're thankful that uh, we, we've always known that the longer it takes to get into a relationship, mm -hmm. the more valued that relationship will be when it succeeds. So we, no hard feelings on that one, George. Not um, a problem. You know, <laughs> I, one other thing to point out, we, we don't, you know, we're a big company, right? Uh, but we don't think that way. We don't think, uh, you know, just being a number. Uh, everybody in this organization knows each other by their name. And, you know, it's no problem for me to walk out onto the floor and have a conversation with somebody out there because they know who I am and I know who they are. Um, so we keep that family way of thinking. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that we've been so successful. Oh, completely. And I, I think I have a humorous story about that. When uh, one of the first times I came to, to visit you guys, it was with uh, we wanted to go see your factory and, and tour the facility. And so, you know, getting across the border, you know, there's techniques to expedite the process. And so you guys said, hey, meet us at this uh, location um, near the border and uh, we'll pick you up and take you across. And OK, sure. Fine. No problem. We had our passports, everything ready. And I think there were three or four of us. And, you know, right on the dot, I think it was nine o'clock a.m., uh, white pickup truck pulls up, nothing fancy, uh, gentleman rolls down the window, says, hey, are you with Midwest Machinery? Cool, yeah, yep, that's us. He's like, well, hop in. So we piled in. I think we surprised you guys with more people coming than than what you had thought. So we literally piled into this uh, truck, and as uh, you know, the, the guy in the front seat, and forgive me, I, I'll forget his name, but uh, I think he's part of your quality control group. David, um, he introduced right. himself. And then uh, Luis, who was driving, uh, said, I'm Luis, and I put two and two together. I was like, wait a second, this is the president of the company. Um, so it was pretty cool that, uh, you know, just a nondescript pickup truck comes by, picks us up, and, and they're, you know, carpooling themselves and bringing us down to the plant. And that, that to me, made it feel very much like family. So I would agree. It but, but it was interesting on our way down because I've never been to Tijuana before and you kind of have uh, maybe some preconceived notions about what manufacturing in Mexico might be. And so we get into town and I was blown away at the vast amount of very large manufacturing facilities and, you know, Fortune 100 names that you guys can count as your neighbors. Yes. Um, so we pulled up and I think you were right across the street from a huge Coca-Cola facility. Um, I think there's maybe even some competitors in that marketplace. And anyway, we pulled up and we walked into the plant and it was the busiest plant I've ever seen in terms of just the amount of people actively working on equipment and projects mm -hmm. in a really super organized fashion. And so Luis gave us the tour of the facility. And I think the most proud moments that you guys had was when you were talking about the team that was building the equipment and what you guys do in an effort to take care of those folks. Um, you, you would be able to tell the stories better than I do. But what impressed us was that you, you have on-site uh, medical facilities, on-site catering, um, facilities. If people need a ride to work, you find a way to make that happen all in an effort to, you know, have great careers for folks in that Valley and in turn produce a really great product for folks like us. So it was, it was impressive. Um, Thanks. really awesome plant. Hey, George, can you give us a <clears throat> kind of a, a walkthrough of what the plant, I guess, how many employees do you have? And then, um, a walkthrough of the plant and then Hopefully we can add some pictures to the video uh, sure. kind of in post-production. 
Sure, not a problem. Uh, yeah, so uh, right now we're a little over 700 employees. We run a couple shifts. Uh, sometimes we run three shifts. Depends on um, if we need to, you know, if we've got a big project or something like that, and we've got to prepare a little bit ahead of time, uh, then we'll we'll put a third shift on. So we're flexible where that's concerned with our employees. Um, as far as the facility is concerned, we've got a, a full sheet metal department. Uh, within that department, we've got a Salvanini machine, we've got uh, uh, Amata machines, uh, manual brake machines, things like that. Um, so we're we're quite automated uh, in the sheet metal department. Uh, outside of that, uh, once metal gets cut and and bent, uh, we've got a full welding department that has uh, 80 welders in it, and they do pretty much nothing all day long except for welding bases, uh, which is our standard way of building. Uh, equipment. We do a uh, structural C-channel welded steel base. Uh, we off offer other options as well as far as metals are concerned, but uh, that's what those guys do all day long. Uh, we also build uh, our own enclosures uh, through NEMA 3R. Uh, fours we, we purchase right now, but we'll have a 4X uh, enclosure here pretty soon. Um, so all that stuff gets done in that department. I, we have a automated paint line uh, and that is basically just to make sure that we're painting all of our equipment on the inside and the outside or outside and the inside, I should say. Uh, we also have paint booths. So if we have custom colors that we don't normally paint within our, our automated paint line, then we could go ahead and do something fancy. As a matter of fact, um, uh, I just sent four pieces of equipment to Las Vegas and it's the coolest dark gray metal flake <laughs> that i see as a matter metal of fact flake? it looks like the paint on my car <laughs> it is That's cool crazy. so yeah. i mean what caused somebody to do metal flake in an air handler is is it that close to people that they might see it or do they just have a standard that everything that goes on it, this building is going to be cool it is in an area it's at, at unlv it's in an area that it's close by the street and they don't want it to look just like your regular old battleship gray. Cool. Awesome. So, so, uh, so that's paint department. And then yeah. the rest of the, the rest of the area, I mean, then we've got storeroom area where we obviously inventory stuff. And then the rest of the area it then is for production. Uh, so that could be stand in place production, or that could be an assembly line production. Okay. So <clears throat> kind of segueing to that, what makes Alliance specifically unique um, when we're talking about air handlers? Oh, uh, first of all, I mean, we're, we're flexible. Um, you know, we, we don't, we don't just build a standard piece of equipment and call it good, right? So being a custom air handling manufacturer, um, that allows us to be able to pretty much fit whatever your requirements are going to be. I mean, our facility is tall enough that we can build three-story buildings or three-story air handlers in here. Uh, you know, we, we uh, Chase Arena in, in the Bay Area, uh, that's all of our equipment on there. And each one wow. of those air handlers are three stories. So they're huge, they're massive, right? Um, I mean, you could build, we could build like three at a time and you know, had to still have area on the rest of the floor that we could build other equipment. Um, but, you know, that's unique about us. Um, our design department, uh, our guys are veterans here. I mean, all of my guys that work in my applications group uh, have been in this industry and for a long time uh, and have been working for us. I think the least years that I've got an employee right now is four years. So he started right around the time, uh, right after I started with the company. So um, they're experienced in what they do and they know in their design uh, how to put it together and not make mistakes. You know, we do a lot of things by hand. Uh, we do have a software program that we utilize to lay out equipment. However, a lot of this stuff is going to be done by hand. So we'll do a physical CAD drawing uh, sometimes to make sure that everything is going to properly fit within the air handler. Yeah, that's what's been nice in, in our tenure with you so far. It's been great because, yes, there's software that we'll use to try to get a project to maybe the 80 percentile and then we'll kick it to you guys to run it through your filter and 
sure enough, you have different ways to skin a cat, maybe be able to, you know, shrink it one way, grow it another way and really optimize the uh, selection. So that's been, I, I would, I would echo that our experience has been that you're very flexible, adaptable, um, especially where, where, you know, that that flexibility and adaptability can add value to the project. Right. Yeah. And, and Troy, you guys know, um, you know, when you send us a project, uh, we have a conversation about it first. Let's make a decision. Is this something that's worthwhile going after? Um, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll get something from whomever and I'll have a, a 10 megs worth of, or a hundred meg worth of documents and, or maybe two gigabytes worth of documents, mm -hmm. something too large to send in, in an email. Um, that to me, you know, our, our guys are going to take a look at that and they're going to say, oh, time out. Um, this is what I need to know. And then we'll get on the telephone with you and pretty much do an interview to find out what this job actually is. You know, what is being done in the facility? I mean, you could tell me it's an MOB, but maybe it's got something, you know, maybe it has a lab inside of the medical office building too that just so happens that it needs to be maybe a higher level laboratory because they've got some bad stuff in there, right? So right. just throwing a regular old air handler into uh, an MOB and it has a lab in it is not necessarily the answer. So these are the things that we're thinking about all the time. Yeah, we, we've seen that. Okay, so if we're talking about uniqueness, we've got adaptability or flexibility. Give me another thing that makes Alliance unique. Uh, well, you know, we were talking about the company a little bit before and being here in Tijuana. Um, though, though we are here in Tijuana, we are, and some people don't know this, we are actually a registered agent with the U.S. government under the uh, American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, uh, Section 1605. So being that registered agent, that enables me to build buy america products or projects in the united states so if you have something that is in the u.s that has that stipulation on it then yeah by all means just let us know about that kind of stuff um you know other things that we have uh you know we're we're oshpod certified so if it's a seismic uh you know type of of application uh we can build definitely you seismic a, equipment yeah right? definitely a concern here in st louis Yes. Yeah, you have one of the biggest <laughs> seismic zones there in the entire and United States. And we're due. States. We're due literally any time. I've Let's been hearing that not. since I was four years old. <laughs> yeah. We're due. We are due. Someday it'll all pay off, all the seismic. Event. Sorry for the sleepless nights. I, I actually <laughs> I actually have a uh, application on my phone that's called QuakeFeed. <laughs> and I got a notification this morning that we actually had a uh, earthquake in, uh, actually, it, it was South Mexico, uh, Acapulco, actually. So, oh, wow. yeah, but yeah, I keep it there so I can, you know, get the little notifications, but you know, it says you had a 1.3, you know, on a uh, uh, earthquake here and it was in this location. I'm going, God, I didn't feel anything. <laughs> the, um, the, could you, exp this always, this is a confusing thing in our industry. What's the difference between buy America and buy American? Um, a lot of people could do buy American because it, 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 it deals with percentages of the materials uh, that are going to be used inside of the equipment, right? So buy America is a lot stricter than buy American. So think okay. of it as buy American. A lot of people can. Uh, the percentages are much smaller. Um, I mean, in reality, in today's world, there's a lot of product that's not manufactured in the United States. It comes from overseas. Um, you know, you can buy a fan that might have parts that were manufactured in China. And in a Buy America application, that percentage of that might just throw that out because it doesn't mm. meet the thresholds, right? And then you've got Buy America that would be um, the uh, Federal Transportation Administration funded. And that is super strict, right? So that's everything has to be built in the United States kind of an application. But in reality, it does not necessarily have to be all put together in the United States. You can, we can actually, I, I mean, I've done a lot of projects that are FTA funded. Um, the, 
the whole trick to that, it's not really a trick. There's there's a procedure that you've got to go through. And that is, I've got to know upfront that it is funded by the Transportation Administration, one. Two, um, we have to get involved along with you, our representative and the engineer and the construction organization or the general contractor to pre-qualify us as being able to build or bid on this particular product or project. Um, the, the key thing there is the communication in the very beginning. So if you do have FTA funded projects, just let us know. Back to what makes Alliance unique, I'm gonna throw one in. <clears throat> you know, through the pandemic and material shortages, uh, it's been a breath of fresh air uh, to get proposals from you on projects. And, you know, frankly, it's been a winning factor in a job or two for us is your lead times. So I, I would say without a doubt, you guys have the industry best lead time and custom. And it's not because of lack of demand. Uh, you know, the plant is running multiple shifts, but somehow through all of this, you've been able to have a lead time that is often less than half of the competitors that we're we're looking at. So, you know, we're quoting jobs with units that are 60,000 CFM and, you know, pretty custom units. And we're at 22 to 26 weeks when we're hearing our competitors are out past a year. Explain that a little bit. Yeah, well, uh, that's going to be a chill water, hot water system for sure. Right. Um, you know, DX is custom DX is going to be a good bit longer. You know, you're going to be in your 30 weeks, but still yet, you know, I mean, there's a lot more piping that's in DX and controls sure. and things like that. So, I mean, it, it takes a lot more or a lot more time to get that all completed. Um, how do we do it? Um, Without manage, management. Yeah, I was going to say, don't give us the secret secret <laughs> sauce, just a little bit no, of the secret just, sauce. Look, I mentioned before that, you know, we look at you as family. We look at our suppliers as family as well. We've got, you know, um, we're connected to everybody that uh, we need to be connected to within our suppliers organizations. And we make sure that we work with them um, daily to ensure that we're going to get product here on time. Uh, we don't just work with one supplier uh, for a particular type of product. We wor work with multiples. So if, and, and, and everybody knows, if they can't produce it fast enough, I'm probably going to go to their competitor and get it there, right? Um, everybody knows the electronics, you know, supply chain right now is just completely upside down. Um, it's hard to get anything, but we find a way somehow, some way to make that happen. You know, we've got internal project managers that all they do all day long is once a project goes to the production or released to the production, they take over to make sure that all of the proper uh, materials and components are ordered. They make sure that the customer is communicated to of when the expectations are to receive that product. Um, they communicate with our suppliers on a daily basis um, and to, to make sure that we are getting those materials on time. They communicate within our own internal organizations to make sure that everything is scheduled and coordinated. So when material gets here, there's, it's going to hit here at three o'clock. I know by four o'clock, I have to have that at that particular piece of equipment so that we can build it. Um, so there's a whole lot of behind the scenes that goes on. We talked about this in the very beginning. That's all the stuff that nobody ever sees. They only see mm -hmm. this big box and it provides, right. you know, warmer, cool air. And there's a, hot, a whole lot more that goes on behind it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I I think I could I'll add a what, little bit. One Go quick ahead. thing. I am a little disappointed in our lead times. At one time, <laughs> I was 12 weeks. <laughs> yeah, well, I look forward to that day. Um, but right it's, now, you're we're still get back there. pick and tail. Um, the other thing that I, I think adds to your lead times is that if you can't buy it quick enough, you'll make it. So I know that you guys also make your own fans sometimes when needed. Um, so I, I think that there's a little bit more vertical integration than some other people have. And then I think the biggest differentiator 
is that you're privately owned and held. And I think that allows you as a manufacturer to uh, spend money when you need to, um, maybe sometimes overspend money um, in order to make something happen, um, carry inventory. Um, you're just able to make decisions for the health of the customer and the health of yourselves rather than, um, you know, 100,000 shareholders. Um, right. So I think that's make make the difference for you. It, it it makes a big, big difference. And and I think that all goes along with the, uh, we think like a family. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have one more point. Um, something that really impressed me is your quality control measures. Um, Cause it's, it's one thing to say I've got fast lead times, but if it shows up and three things are on it are broken and the customers, you know, contractors are yelling at us or whoever, uh, that's a whole nother thing. So tell us about your quality control measures you have um, when you're building these air handlers. Sure. Well, sometimes we can't stop things from breaking when they're shipping. Sure. It's a big, it's a big box and it does get bounced around a good bit, but um, we try to go through uh, every step possible to make sure that things like that don't happen. So when, you know, we ship boxes or filters or whatever the case be inside of an air handler, uh, we're going to make sure that all that stuff gets tied down so it doesn't get shaken around as it's driving. Uh, you, you can't do anything about, um, you know, uh, an accident. Uh, mm -hmm. but you can try to make sure that your equipment's going to get to the job site the way that it needs to, the way that it left this factory. Uh, so for that reason, for example, part of our quality process is that all of our uh, transportation guys, all of our freight guys um, have to use chains and shackle down the equipment on their beds. Uh, it is forbidden to ever strap a piece of equipment leaving this yard. If we see, and, and when equipment gets loaded onto trucks, our transportation department is physically out there making sure that everything is done properly. And if they ever see somebody pull out a canvas strap and, and you know go throw it over the top of a piece of equipment, they'll take it away from them. Uh, so those are things that we make sure happen. Uh, but as far as quality is concerned, um, David, our quality manager, comes from the medical industry, the medical device industry. So he is all about crossing T's, dotting I's, making sure that everything is as perfect as it possibly can be. And that's the mentality that he uses when he puts all together his or his quality programs together here for us here at the factory. Uh, he has a group of people that work for him that all they do all day long is inspect. Um, we make sure that we look at things that, for example, if we see frayed wire or something like that, and it happens, mm -hmm. uh, his guys are going to catch things like that, and it's going to get fixed before we send it out, right? And if there would ever be something that for whatever purpose, uh, you know, it was broken here at the factory or maybe, I don't know, maybe something came in damage or something like that. It's his organization that does all that full inspecting of componentry and materials as it's coming into the factory to make sure that they catch it and to make sure that before it leaves the factory, it's in perfect working condition. Um, so super strict. Um, I will tell you some of the guys on the floor, when they see the quality guys come around, <laughs> they're not too happy, but uh, he's done a super great job with our organization for that. And, and one of the other things that we can do is a lot of times, you know, we'll build for customers that may have um, a, a job or a specific quality uh, program, or maybe it's a big enough organization that they have their own quality programs. So David does a great job of integrating their programs uh, into our program to make sure that we follow their guidelines as we're inspecting the equipment. Great. Well, well, before we get uh, too far down talking about Alliance, I think it'd be a shame to have somebody that's been in the industry for 30 years, not tell us some of the, some of the do's and don'ts that you've come across. So George, uh, if you think about the 
hundreds of opportunities that you see or projects that you've been on, whether Alliance or other stops. Give us, you know, if you think about an engineer. What are some of the, you know, three or four big mistakes that people make uh, either in the application or design of air handlers that uh, you think we should try to avoid? Uh, one uh, well, one thing in particular, and I'll start it this way, is, um, you know, I spent uh, a bunch of years as a representative. So in your shoes, right? So, you know, if you make a mistake, you're going to pay for it. It's coming oh, yeah. out of your pocket, right? So y- you learn what to not do when you make the mistake the first time. Uh, sometimes you make it a second time. Not a good not a good thing the second time. That's when you hit yourself in the head, right? Um, but I've taken that and brought it into the manufacturing part of the business, right? So I think that that's what makes uh, me a little more unique is because I understand both sides of the fence. Uh, you know, we're not just a manufacturer, a supplier. Here's a box. Thank you. Uh, we're there full service. Uh to support you the whole ways to support you, our customer, right? So that you can support your customer. That's the key thing. So everything rolls, you know, and it gets bigger and we don't, we don't want to have a big snowball at the end. We want the snowball to be the same size uh, once the job is finished. Um, But mistakes, and, and I learned this being a representative is if you don't measure twice, (laughs) <laughs> and cut once, then you're going to have to cut it again, right? Mm-hmm. And, and everybody knows that rule. So that's a super critical thing to do. When you're doing a retrofit project, it's really important to know what is going on at the job site itself because you don't want your contractor to call you up and say, hey, Troy, I got a problem. This piece of equipment that you sold me is not fitting the curb the way that you said it was. So sending information and and getting as much information as possible is really critical. And that doesn't just start with you guys. That goes the whole ways to the owner. If I mean, they're contacting somebody to replace an air handler. We got to get that a guy involved uh, because he's got critical information as build drawings, things like that, of that piece of equipment that he has there. And it's not just as simple as saying, give me a model X, Y, Z, one, two, three, because there's not a whole lot of that information that you can find out there. Right. And a lot of that stuff was done by hand. Um, so it's really super important to know exactly what's going on with the piece of equipment in a retrofit application at the job site. Super important. Um, what's going on? at the actual site, even if it's not a retrofit application. You know, what are my dimensional uh, restraints that I need to be looking at whenever I'm designing the equipment? You know, you can say, give me a standard 30,000 CFM air handler, and I'm gonna give you what my standard box size is going to be for that. But when I send it to the engineer, then the engineer is going to look at that and it's like, oh, no, 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 no. I need this to be, you know, four feet shorter Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're going to have to cram everything in there. Well, most people think that, yeah, four feet shorter, cram everything in there. That's not the answer. I mean, the reason you're buying a custom air handler is because you want a piece of equipment that's going to last you 30, 40 years. First off, second of off, you want a piece of equipment that is going to operate properly. So just forcing air into a duct doesn't always work. Uh, you got to think about What is around the rest of the building and how is this traveling and things like that? I don't need to see the entire ductwork layouts, but I do need to know what is this feeding. So those are two really super important things is make sure you are aware of your surroundings and measure twice, cut once. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the retrofit and not to go back to something like an advertisement, (laughs) but to all of our contractors and end users out there that might be listening to this, um, we know of a lot of projects that were postponed or delayed um, till another year or so because of manufacturer lead time. So what you're hearing here is Alliance does a great job with retrofit um, and they 
take a lot of care and detail to make sure that, especially on retrofit applications, that uh, field measurements are taken properly so that you can you know, get the installation done um, as needed. But that also brings into account that you guys will do uh, knockdown um, and field built air handlers for retrofit applications right exactly and and we we can do that in a number of different ways so if you've got super small door openings um just telling me that it's a 36 inch wide door with a seven foot height on it is not good enough i i need to know what's down the hallway beyond that door because your unit at 30,000 cfm it's going to be short but it's going to be really wide and mm -hmm. you might not be able to make a turn to get it into the mechanical room that it has to go into. So we need to know these things up front because we're going to recommend directly to you. You don't want to build this as split sections. You want to build this as knockdown construction. So you either we either build it and fit it together and put it on a truck and ship it to you and you take it apart and then reassemble it on the site. Or I put everything on pallets, which is a lot easier and and I promote palletized construction, although it costs a little bit more to do palletized construction. Uh, you save yourself in the long run because you don't have to take pieces of equipment apart and then re-put it back together again. Right. So super important to do that. All right, I'm going to hijack the agenda a little bit because um, there's two more. This I keep coming up with things that I want to <laughs> ask you about. It When we talk to customers, a couple of big topics are, um, one is, you know, how do we seal the unit? Um, against leaks and mm -hmm. every manufacturer has a different take on that. I'd like to get your take on it. And number two, talk about sound and sound performance and attenuation, um, because I think you guys have an interesting story with sound as well. So take those however you want, one and two or two and one, but uh, can you talk to that? Um, uh, well, well, we'll talk sound first. Uh, sounds, sound can be super important or sound can be important. I won't necessarily say it sounds never important because um, we have a project that we're working on right now that it's not important in the facility that this unit's cooling, but it is important on the outside because it okay. generates too much noise. Think of it this way. If we're building a DX piece of equipment and you're in a city area and this building had happens to be a little taller than this building is and the piece of equipment's right here and you got people living in apartments here they're going to hear those condenser fans going off all the time so coming up with the proper design of uh, what components to use in there is going to be a super critical thing for exterior sound right nobody wants mm -hmm. to hear you know going off I try to try to make sound effects. I can't <laughs> do it very well. We'll edit nobody, that in. Don't worry. <laughs> no, no, thanks. No, nobody have, wants to hear it. They want to make sure that it's keeping them comfortable, but they don't want to hear it, right? Um, but in those applications where sound is important or possibly critical, libraries, concert halls, uh, you know, believe it or not, anything that you build is going to have some sound requirement to it. But it's not always important. And this is sometimes I see, I see this with having an acoustician um, looking at equipment that they're thinking that the particular building needs to be like a library, but it doesn't need to be like a library. So sometimes you can build too much sound attenuation that into a unit that might not necessarily be required. Mm -hmm. uh, but sound is always important. How do you do it? Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I mean, you know, thicker walls, different types of insulation, uh, attenuation inside the air handler, uh, and there's different types of attenuation that you can use inside of an air handler. You know, changing to a, a 12 blade will on a fan can reduce sound. Uh, you know, maybe changing the materials on the wheel uh, might help out. Uh, maybe using vibration isolation on it. Uh, those are all kinds of things that can help out in reducing sound. You know, maybe using a uh, uh, an isolation curb under your air handler to help reduce sound. So there's there's a lot of things that can be done to uh, 
make sure that your air handler is operating the way that it needs to. Um, where I was just thinking where sound you may think might not be important, you might be surprised. Yeah. I guess it all depends on who's uh, the tenant and how close to the machine they are. That's that's our experience. Well, think of uh, going to a concert hall. Oh, yeah. A rock concert hall. And believe it or not, sound is important. I mean, they're running concerts at 108 dB or more, and sound is actually important there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I was the total side. You can edit this out later. I was in church. We go to the same church and uh, they screwed up the sound because <laughs> it was 115 decibels in our church a couple of <laughs> weeks ago. Um, and I, there's no way I would have been able to hear a fan. Um, what the, the, the thing that I'd say about sound that I was impressed with uh, working with Alliance so far is we're, we're looking at a project now and we are not basis of design, but the basis of design unit has a lot of attenuation on it, um, expensive attenuation and attenuation that's causing the lead time to be much longer. And the manufacturer who is basis of design is not known to build a robust unit. Whereas we're with Alliance, we're taking a different look at it that is really looking at, well, let's look at the unit first and make sure we're building that sound and structurally solid so that it is not making as much noise that we then have to attenuate downstream. And right. so that that's that's where I think that Alliance has a leadership opportunity um, to leverage. So let's talk about uh, ceiling and metal to metal contact and all of those buzzwords that we have in the in the custom world. Uh, all right, so we're we're uh, old school in our thought approach for for uh, thermal break, um, we use, like a lot of manufacturers still use today, a gasketed type system uh, inside of our air handlers to stop that metal bridging or that thermal bridging from going between the inside and the outside of the air handler. Um, the the um, construction of the unit has a lot to play with the amount of leaking that you're going to have on your piece of equipment. So if you use flimsy screws, you're going to get flimsy results. Um, So we don't do that kind of thing. Uh, We use way better quality when we're constructing our walls uh, and the rest of the equipment. Um, We, we, Although we can do a bolted base, we don't do many bolted bases. As a matter of fact, we probably, I think, have done three in my career with with Alliance Air products. Um, and they're they're working perfectly fine, and it's how we put them together. But you know, using using a tech screw is not going to do it. Um, building structure into your wall is a very important thing. Uh, and it's because it stops your unit from racking, right? Mm-hmm. When when you're lifting it up, it's metal. It's going to bend. That it, It's just how it goes. It's so a flimsy sheet metal box. <laughs> exactly. So if you build structure into your walls, that makes a big difference. Um, the, the insulation that we talked about um, on the floor is important to make sure that you're sealing any potential leakage that could be coming out of the floor as well. I won't get into all of the trade secrets that, you know, how we build our equipment, but I'll just, I'll I'll leave it as building your box properly will net you lower leakage rates. Okay. And that's a super important thing. If you need a higher percentage then you need to build a thicker wall and more um, 
structure into the wall to ensure that in a high pressure application, you're not going to leak it out of the unit. But one thing I will say about leakage, and I don't mean to offend anybody with this, but if you ask for a class two leakage rate, which is less than a half percent at 12 inches of total static pressure on an air handler, and it's only a 4,000 CFM air handler, you're never going to get to 12 inches of total static pressure unless it's a super highly specialized piece of equipment. So just please, we'd like to see when we get plans and specifications that the the um, the leakage classification or the leakage uh, rates that you're looking for reflect what you're actually designing so that sounds like a great second podcast for us to do with you sometime to get into some more details on uh, leakage and sound design um, so I, I think we're probably getting close to running out of time but um, you know if i were to summarize what hopefully our listeners have heard is that um, Alliance kind of stands alone in terms of being able to provide a uh, very custom air handler at exceptional quality and very good lead times. And frankly, that's what I want our customers to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I'd like to add to that a little bit about Midwest Machinery Company. Um, if you haven't worked with us in a uh, customer handler application, um, we also have uh, people on staff with considerable experience in customer handlers. We've, you know, got uh, one of our product champions uh, worked at a major, um, I will say, another top three customer handler manufacturer as an application engineer for three years. So, in terms of the amount of opportunities that he's seen and built proposals on. Um, it's probably more than I'll see in a lifetime. Um, and then we've got other folks on our team that have worked for, you know, the, the big three or four um, chiller slash air handler manufacturers and been through their training program. So we Midwest Machinery Company, if you haven't, if you think of us as uh, an air site or a water site company and you, you haven't really thought about us as an air site company, um, do consider it because we've got the experience uh, to be able to help you on your projects. But before we go, the most important question two days prior to Thanksgiving um, is any special Thanksgiving traditions and what is your favorite side dish? Oh, my God. Ah. And you you stand a chance to, you know, alienate family members that Mm -hmm. bring side dishes that you don't care for. <laughs> um, and I'm sure all your family members will be listening to this podcast. So. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to be picky this year because I'm going to be in the middle of Mexico for uh, Thanksgiving. So it, it's uh, getting it catered, shall we say. Uh, there we go. <laughs> but uh, I, I know it's going to be good. Don't worry. So I'm not going to be picky. Uh, my gosh. Uh, favorite dish. Uh I am a fan of drier stuffing as opposed to wet stuffing. <laughs> All right. So okay. In, in my house, dry stuffing world. there were always two <laughs> stuffings that were made and one specially for me that nobody wanted to eat. So I always <laughs> had enough for leftovers. Well, you know, and the weather stuffing came out of the turkey and, you know, suspect as to you know, yeah. whether or not it's uh, safe. But anyway, Brian, what, what's your favorite side? Uh, well, Missouri, so I'll use the accent, the sweet potato, sweet potato casserole. But it has sweet to have the brown sugar casserole. and the, the uh, marshmallows, marshmallows on it. Marshmallows yep. on top. Yep. That you got to be careful not to burn in the broiler. Yep. Yep. Uh, mine is, uh, and she's not listening to this, so I'm not brown nosing but my wife makes a killer cornbread sausage sage cranberry stuffing that uh she can't wait to have so awesome. yeah awesome well hey, I don't know, you did, this was a question that came out of the blue i mean why didn't you put this on the list well we didn't want you to prepare for it uh ah. so clearly you you were fumbling for the right answer and uh so the tradition i heard is when i'm in mexico i'm gonna have it catered <laughs> and uh, favorite side dish is dry stuffing. So we now know a lot about you, George. 
There you go. For uh, for those of uh, the listening area that is interested in air handlers, um, especially Alliance, f- for our purposes, what states are we in? Sure. As far as Midwest machinery goes. So uh, St. Louis, the company headquarters, covers the southern two thirds of Illinois and the eastern two thirds of Missouri. Um, then our Kansas City office covers the uh, western third of Missouri in all of Kansas. And then our Oklahoma office covers all of Oklahoma, the panhandle of Texas, and northwest Arkansas. And, you know, just hop onto our website, midwestmachinery.net, and uh, we've got maps and locations and contact info for all of those. Great question, Brian. And then, George, obviously for you nationwide, I mean, I guess, are you specifically North America or do you do any stuff over in Europe and Asia? Uh, what's your what's your regions and then what's the best way to reach out to Alliance? Sure. Main main. Uh... Focus, obviously, is the United States of America. Uh, there are some territories that I'm not uh, currently in um, by design. Uh, so it's sure. going to be uh, like north central U.S., like the Plain States, uh, Chicagoland. Uh, don't have representation there or the southeast, uh, Florida, okay. uh, Atlanta, um, Arkansas, those places right there. So you guys really going south. Okay. Um, East would be the right border before you get into, um, uh, well, Indianapolis, we have covered Ohio, sorry. Yeah, so anything just south of there is not going to be covered. Um, We do work in South America. Uh, We have built some equipment that has gone uh, overseas uh, to Europe and to uh, uh, Asia. But um, those are sort of somewhat more specialized. The stuff that we're doing in Mexico and South America, though, uh, we do a decent amount of business down there as well. And then, I mean, to get in touch with us, it's easy. Uh, www.allianceairproducts.com. Uh, you click on representatives and you can simply go in and type your zip code or a city name and it could tell you if we've got representation there. Awesome. All right. Well, Thanks for listening to uh, our entire audience um, and have uh, good holidays, Thanksgiving. Um, and as always, keep engineering for tomorrow today. Thanks for joining us on Engineering Tomorrow. If you liked the show, please take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. For even more great engineering or construction knowledge, visit engineeringtomorrow.blog.